All right. So I am super excited to chat with today's guest, Sally K. Norton. We are going to be talking about toxic superfoods with an emphasis on oxalates. And so I'm going to give Sally's bio here, and then we're going to start our conversation. So Sally K. Norton holds a nutrition degree from Cornell University and a master's degree in public health. Her path to becoming a leading expert on dietary oxalate includes a prior career working at major medical schools and medical education and public health research. Her personal healing experience inspired years of research that led to her book, Toxic Superfoods, which was released in January 2023 from Rodale Press, and it's available everywhere books are sold. And as a leading expert on oxalates and food, Sally's work has been featured by podcasters, radio shows, and several online and print journals. And for more information, you could visit sallyknorton.com or follow Sally on YouTube and social media. And of course, I'll include all those links in the show notes. And thank you so much for joining us, Sally. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I agree. You know, we were chatting a little bit before and I told you that, you know, I found you, you, you were presenting at a recent conference. And then when you mentioned your book, I purchased the audio version of that and, and went through that very quickly. And I was already familiar with oxalates, but just you, of course, the book was so comprehensive and still I learned so much and just excited to for you to share with my audience uh, just the impact of these toxic superfoods. Yeah, it's really shocking to those of us who've been health geeks a long time and happily gobbling up plants we trusted and find out that that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I really felt like I needed to like put together my life tragedy in a book to, because I was so interested to understand why, what the heck, why don't I know this? I'm supposed to know stuff. How come I'm stupid? <laughs> it's like, so this is the book about why I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be well, more informed and share that with others because I realize a lot more than just me needs to know about this. Yeah, well, I'm very thankful you put this book together. And if you could start off just by briefly explaining what are oxalates and why did you start focusing on oxalates? What, what led you to write this book? Well, oxalates are a set of chemicals that are natural made by nature and we eat it in, in plant foods primarily because plants like to make it. And um, they, we use the term oxalates plural to refer to oxalic acid an acidic ion and uh, the oxalate crystals that it makes. Calcium oxalate is typical. Plants build calcium oxalate crystals. They produce oxalic acid. They make vitamin C and turn it into oxalic acid. And, you know, the, it's plants like spinach and trees who make nuts and seeds and uh, root vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes and so on are loaded with this stuff. Um, and also there's ox oxalic acid and oxalic crystals can come not just from the foods we eat, but a little bit every day is produced in our metabolism. It's a natural metabolic waste product that we pee out. Uh, that's the main exit route for oxalates out of the body. Uh, also, you can breathe it in from polluted air. It just naturally forms in polluted air. So major cities like Beijing and LA probably have a fair amount of oxalic acid in them. In fact, oxalic acid is a major component of acid rain. Um, and um, you can even have it in the air if you have a lots of black mold growing in the house because it's an end product of mold metabolism. And the way most people have heard about oxalates is they've heard of the idea and hopefully never had kidney stones that's made of calcium oxalate, but your doctor usually just says, oh, that's calcium stones. <laughs> they forget to mention oxalates and where they come from. Yeah, and unfortunately people keep on eating those foods and they don't eliminate the source and maybe they'll get lucky and not get future kidney stones, but some of them of course do get recurring. And that, the so, nice thing about a kidney stone is that it is a possible path for you to learn about oxalates and learn that you shouldn't be eating so many. That wasn't my path. I've never had a kidney stone. I don't think I ever will. I've peed out a lot of oxalates and you can tell because you can get cloudy urine because you can pee out the little crystals that build up into stones without getting the stones. And if you have a lot of those crystals that are big enough, they, the light bounces off of them and it makes your urine look all cloudy, like sort of opaque -ish, a little bit white, as if there's a little bit of milk in there or something. That's the extra crystals in the urine, which is a not a good thing to have. I've had that most of my life. 
I'm finally getting over that. Now I've stopped eating oxalates for nine and a half years. And I have, I don't see that cloud of urine very often at all anymore. So I'm just about in my 10th year getting over the, uh, <laughs> the oxalate poisoning I had. And when I figured out that oxalate was affecting my arthritis and I went on this diet and then all these other things happened, I got over a sleep disorder, all this stuff happened. I realized like all of my health problems, which have been numerous and have been going on since I was about 12 years old, have a connection to the healthy diet that I've been eating, the healthy organic vegetables I've been growing in my own garden, the home cooked, wholesome organic diet. I'm like, holy crap, how could this? Ah. So I started just sharing it um, publicly in free little um, talks at the local health food store. It was really fascinated by how many people need to hear this because how many people I'm seeing it more, you know, in, in people around me and started to learn from talking to people about it, how this just, just plays with your whole sense of reality. I mean, we're so hung up on believing that plants are so wonderful and benign and safe, in fact, superheroes, that it's a difficult message to convey. So I've been trying to figure out how to explain it. And so the book was a real effort to do that. Yeah, I was telling you also be, before we started recording that Years ago, it was 2016, I think, when I did a urinary oxalate test and it tested positive. And at the time, I was loading my my smoothie with spinach and other high oxalate foods, and so I eliminated the spinach after seeing that. But I, at that time, I also was just thinking kidney stones too. I wasn't thinking about the impact that it has on other areas of the body. And of course, one of those one of those areas is the thyroid gland. And just because the audience happens to be people with hyperthyroidism, Hashimoto's, other types of thyroid conditions. But can you dive a little bit into the research and what you found as far as the impact of oxalates on the thyroid? Well, the thyroid is, is fascinating with oxalates because it's so common to have oxalate crystals, which are essentially like kidney stones, building up in the thyroid gland. I had that, I was you know eating my high oxalate sweet potatoes every day for years. And I had a big swollen lumps in my throat that I hadn't noticed, but my on a physical exam, thank God a physical exam actually looked and touched me because he's like, I got to send you for a scan because your thyroid's all swollen up. And um, so I had multiple scans and all this stuff. And, and I ended up, you know, I've been on and off taking Armour Thyroid and going on a low oxalate diet, reduced my um, Hashimoto's like look like the, there was, I was sort of equivocally with Hashimoto's D different doctors said yes different doctors said no different doctors said yes and like nobody could figure out if I had Hashimoto's or not but all that Hashimoto's like blood work disappeared after I quit the oxalates and we see that a lot uh, Hashimoto's disappears and thyroid numbers improve um, the literature is a little bit weak on it other than the fact that we keep seeing in thyroid studies that are looking for oxalate a very high prevalence of oxalate in the thyroid gland that gets worse with time. So the older you are, the more likely it is you have crystals forming that are big enough in the thyroid gland to be seen in a microscopic examination of tissue sampling. The thyroid gland tissues um, degenerate quickly though. So you're taking a biopsy or taking a piece out of a cadaver for an autopsy or you know some other type of medical study, you have to examine that tissue within two hours or else the dissolving acidity of the tissues can um, cause a loss of the crystals. Either they dissolve or they float away. When you cut the sample to make a thin enough sample to put on a slide to see if there's crystals in the thyroid tissue, you can literally slice the crystals out of them and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, you don't see the crystals. So despite the difficulty in seeing the bigger crystals, um, they find it in 85% of thyroid glands in people over age 50. Uh, and that number is a more recent number versus one that had been done like 20 years earlier where they saw a lower number. And so it seems as if, and it's not enough data points to really say this for sure, but it seems as if the prevalence of oxalate, obvious big crystals in the thyroid gland are getting worse with time, which makes sense because we've added the French fry, the potato chip, and the uh, baked potato to every meal every day nowadays since the, since the invention of McDonald's. You know, we've got potato chips and so on. These are fairly new foods. And then other high oxalate foods are being used more and more now too. So the, 
it's a lot of questions about how much these crystals are interfering with function, but wherever you see the crystals, that area, those tissues that are immediately adjacent are not functional. You lose thyroid function wherever the crystals are and where you've, you've got inflammation and damage occurring because the crystals draw more inflammatory action and creates inflammatory problems in tissues, the more the oxalate collects. So I think that's another reason why with age, it gets worse because you've had more years of inflammation there and more years of attracting and having tissues that are sticky now. Wherever you have inflammation in the body, that the way the molecules line up, it makes them more sticky to oxalate. So the oxalates tend to, the, the acid that gets in the body precipitate out into crystals and then stick in those tissues. And because of inflammation, it's hard to get rid of them. Do oxalates ever show up on like a thyroid ultrasound, for example? Um, it's really difficult to say that there's oxalate there from any of these scans, whether it's ultrasound or MRI or CT scan. Sometimes you can find crystals with MRI, but it's probably only at most a third of the time where it actually tells you that there's something there that could be oxalate. So it's very tough to, that's why we don't know about oxalate. That's why this isn't common knowledge because it's not easy to detect it. And then it's not just the direct impact on the thyroid, but as I'm sure you know, most, auto, most thyroid conditions, you mentioned Hashimoto's, most are autoimmune Hashimoto's and Graves. So the impact of oxalates on the gut, which if you have that increase in intestinal permeability, that could be a factor with autoimmunity. So it's also could have that indirect effect when it comes to Graves, Hashimoto's, as well as other autoimmune conditions, correct? No question about it. I think it's a major provocateur in the tissues and the, the tissue damage that oxalate causes to various tissues turns on inflammation. So you now, the oxalate, the acid and the crystals that you're eating in your smoothie, right? Because you're putting chia seeds and you're putting spinach and chard and turmeric and these things that are very high in oxalate. So there's crystals and acid there. That's injuring the cells that lines the entire digestive tract for the full 24 hours that it's roaming around. Those bigger crystals that the plants make aren't absorbed necessarily, but the crystals are even worse than the acid, especially the small crystals that are invisible. They're like really invisible. They're nano size, really smaller. The smaller the crystal, the more injurious it is to cells. It's, um, it actually has been designated in many different studies that it's probably a, causes dysfunction of what we call the epithelial barrier function. So epithelium is this, these cells that line um, the surfaces of the body that interface with the outer world your mouth, your throat, your stomach, and so on, your lungs, your bladder, so on. These epithelial cells, really, it's like one single layer that has to be continuous, and they're all hooked together with these little tight junctions. So you have this nice continuous layer of cells, which is one little thin layer. And the, um, especially the nanoparticles have a very strong affinity for the fats and membranes. And they can wrap themselves in the fats of the membranes, kind of be put in a little pocket, and we call these lipid crystals. And they, the crystals also have these electromagnetic charges, which messes up the electromagnetic structures of the membranes because membranes are like a battery where you have a positive charge on one side and a negative charge on the other. It's very, life itself is very sensitive to the electromagnetics. And um, that disrupts the cell membranes too. So the whole structure, which fatty acids are on the inside versus the outside of the, the leaflet, as we call the double layered fatty membrane, gets scrambled. And so between the scrambling of the membrane and the lipid crystals, you lose the healthy tight junctions because the tight junctions are on what we call like the lateral side of the membranes where they're hooking together as they're lined up side by side by side. Those sides are hooked together with this Velcro-like tight junction. These are protein molecules in the membranes that all hook together, but now you've scrambled the membrane. And the part that should be on the face is on the, you know, it's like all messed up. And now you lose that tight barrier function on a cell to cell basis, but you can also, the, the bigger crystals can cause uh, punctures. You literally lose uh, 50 cells in a smash. If some, one of the big crystals causes a puncture in the, um, in the digestive lining that both of the, all of these things, the damaged membranes, the loss of the tight junctions, 
and the ripping apart and, and busting through the cell membranes and the cells is enough to turn on inflammation because your immune system and related tissues are busy looking for danger. Well, this is dangerous. I got injured. I'm leaking my parts as a cell. I've got structures falling around. And where you have this damage and leaking cells and they're dropping your vacuoles and parts and pieces and they're dying off, you've got this debris forming and debris promotes precipitation. So the oxalic acid continues to precipitate out into more nanocrystals and more microcrystals and you get more stickiness and you have this vicious cycle of cellular destruction, which requires the immune system to come in and say, hey guys, I got to protect you and deal with this mess. And you can be um, creating all kinds of issues, including like sarcoidosis and granuloma diseases as the immune cells come in and try to deal with these big crystals. They have to you know, try to phagotize, you know, eat them and break them apart. Um, and we, there's definite, um, there's definite evidence that all of this can lead to Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, all kinds of uh, frank diseases, but it can also just lead to food allergies and inflammation and just poor digestion and dysbiosis, because of course, crystals and acid and mayhem promotes dysbiosis and, and, and also the oxalate causes nerve toxicity. And the nerves are what helps to control the sphincters that controls the movement of food. So you don't have reflux if you have a working sphincter, but if your sphincter is not working well, you get acid reflux or leaks elsewhere through the system. And you've got nerves misfiring. You have nerves that are turned on by the toxicity of oxalates because that what they're doing is stealing electrolytes in ways that's messing up their ability to, to manage their electrolytes in the nerves. You get nerves turned on. You get muscles turned on in spastic ways. And what you can get is like peristalsis that's moving in the wrong direction. <laughs> you can get um, sort of paralysis and fibromyalgia of the muscles of the gut and so on. So you get um, motility problems where you get problems with constipation and diarrhea and reflux and even uh, fecal incontinence and all kinds of problems. It's not good. So it d definitely disrupts the gut barrier from what you said, the intestinal barrier. Is, is there any evidence that it can affect the blood brain barrier? It can affect any cell it gets to. And, and, the cell membranes are delicate, complicated structures. And if you start scrambling the cell membrane structure, you're gonna start scrambling those tight junctions. So it's a slightly different structure in the blood brain barrier than it is in the epithelial of the, of the gut lining. But the same, the principles apply. Cells need to maintain their structure. And when you start doing things that messes up their structure, function falls apart because function depends on structure. Can, yeah. you, can you talk about some of the foods higher in oxalates? I mean, you, you, I know you go deep into this in your book, but if you could just give a, a, a lot of people listening know that spinach is probably number one, but if you could maybe give like some of the, the main ones that yeah. you definitely avoid. The only thing worse than spinach is beet greens and chard. And unfortunately they tend to come together in like these little leafy salad mixes and things. <laughs> And uh, so chard and beet greens are basically the same thing. The red stem is even worse than the white stem chard. And both of those are worse than spinach. Sorrel is terrible. So if you're a gardener and you're doing a lot of sorrel, that's not so good. But most people can't buy it in store. So that's not a big deal. It's, what, it's only a big deal if you eat it. So if you don't eat it, you're fine. <laughs> but the popular food right now is almonds are everywhere in everything. It could be a donut. It's covered in almonds. And almonds are the worst. They're very toxic, not just from oxalate, but other toxins as well. If, and uh, cashews are not good. Peanuts and pine nuts are all high oxalate and problems. And they're tough on the gut for many other reasons too. Seeds like nuts and other seeds are designed to be indigestible. And the plant toxins that are toxic to us, their major effects are gut damage. So there's other, other problems in these same high oxalate foods and in some other plant foods that aren't even high in oxalate that may not be good if you have inflammatory problems. So then there's the beans, which is another type of seed. Black beans and the white beans and great northerns and other types of white beans are very high in oxalate, but the peas are not so bad. So 
chickpeas and black eyed peas are much lower. Now, if you're going gluten free, then you've heard of quinoa, teff, buckwheat. Those are uber high in oxalate and other plant uh, chemicals. And so if you're going gluten free, you're probably doing high oxalates with them. There's the chia, hemp, cumin seeds, there's the turmeric. And then the fruit world, star fruit, which you don't eat in the US, but is, is, is like a spinach in Brazil and Southeast Asia. They use it like we do superfood. Star fruit is terrible. Blackberries, pomegranate fruits, and kiwi are all high in oxalate. So those are pretty popular trusted foods and we're being encouraged to eat them. I mean, this is the real reason why oxalates are dangerous is because we're ignorant about it and we're being told by trusted authorities to eat these foods because they're supposedly so great for us uh, without any warning whatsoever that if you're frail, a child, elderly, have kidney stones, have inflammatory diseases, that you need to be aware of oxalate, but you never see that on the labels anywhere. And you mentioned sweet potatoes earlier in your experience. Oh, yeah. so how, how, how bad are those? Oh, boy, the sweet potato. I trusted that puppy because I had to be on a wheat-free diet and was using sweet potatoes every day and still eating Swiss chard. A boiled sweet potato. Now, boiling helps you leach out some of that soluble oxalate. So when you boil a sweet potato, you remove a, some of the soluble oxalate. It's mostly the insoluble, which is particles and crystals. Um, but that is still like a standard six ounce portion is over a hundred milligrams of oxalate. And that's a lot. You get over 70 in any meal. That's really putting a, a setting up a toxic condition post meal for the next six, eight, 10 hours. Um, and then if you're eating baked sweet potato, then you have like 30% solubility and the amount in that serving is going to be like 150 milligrams of oxalate, which is even worse. So Sweet potatoes, delicious, versatile, hold a lot of butter and salt with elegance and pretty on the plate. I wouldn't go there. And, and this is the thing. I had trouble giving up my sweet potatoes. <laughs> I grew organic sweet potatoes. I used them every day. And when I started the diet, the first time I actually tried this diet back in 2009, and I, I didn't see the benefits necessarily. And I went back on sweet potatoes and I didn't see a problem with them because actually if you go back on oxalates when you've gotten rid of them from your diet, it can actually help you feel better temporarily. So I did, I'm did. i like, ah, well, whatever oxalates are in sweet potatoes, they don't bother me. That kind of oxalates, okay, you know? So I didn't know. I was, based on the information I had at that time, I didn't understand it. So yeah, sweet potatoes. Sorry, bud. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've been recommending for years just because uh, a lot of my patients with Hashimoto's graze follow an autoimmune protocol. And yeah, and it's supposedly this low allergy food. That's why I was relying on it as a staple because I couldn't trust the grains and the beans anymore. It was clear to me that that was causing inflammation for me. And so I was relying on sweet potato for that reason, because I was thinking it was the lowest allergy starch you could possibly eat. And I was relying on it as a staple. Not a and, good idea. And cooking. So getting back to cooking, not just sweet potatoes, but cooking spinach or roasting almonds or cashews, those really don't significantly reduce the oxalates then? Heat doesn't do anything to oxalates. You'd have to incinerate them for hours in a top, you know, 400 degree fire to get to transform oxalates into something else. So heat itself does you no good at all. Boiling can help leach some out in broccoli and in sweet potatoes and a few other foods, but we don't have a lot of testing to know. I noticed in the, the few tests we have of asparagus that the boiled has exactly the same amount of oxalate as the non-boiled or roasted or raw. And it's like, it doesn't change it at all. So some foods will leach out, but leaching out is asking you to throw away the water. And if you're in a habit of saving the vegetable liquids and using them in your smoothies or soups, then you're not achieving anything except now that the soluble oxalate is floating in a water solution it has more power to pass through those tight junctions on their healthy gut and get into the body more easily so you if you drink the liquor from boiling vegetables you kind of put that oxalate on steroids in terms of its toxicity same with smoothies and, and juicing you basically liberating the oxalates that are now originally contained in cells behind cell walls and cell vacuoles inside of cells 
got this sort of protection a little bit from them with your teeth doesn't always get through cell walls. You don't really digest vegetables that well in, in the old world of chewing. But in the new world of juicing and smoothies, you can liberate these crystals and really expose them. They bust out of the vacuoles and now you've got sharp pointy arrows and other shaped crystals just irritating your gut. And you've got the acid free to float in the water right into the body. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk more about smoothies, but I, I feel the need to bring up dark chocolate because that's something else that a lot of people like to eat. So just, just like a little square of dark chocolate, is, is that okay? Or is that still not acceptable? No, it always depends on dose with toxicity. And the, a lot of the studies are done with milk chocolate because it's a very bioavailable. It's a simple, easy thing to get volunteers to eat. Hey, eat this little half a chocolate bar for us and we'll take your urine and we'll give you 10 bucks. And you're like, sure, I'll do that. No problem, free chocolate. So we know that the, the uh, oxalate in chocolate is be very bioavailable, gets into the, the kidneys pretty quickly, but it, it's a long journey to get there <laughs> to the kidneys. We really tend to just measure it on the exit. We don't know much about the black box between your teeth and your kidneys. Um, and that's important to know, but yeah, just, um, two, uh, two ounces, probably actually an ounce, an ounce of chocolate, dark chocolate is enough to create a toxic situation in the body. Wow. So what is that? Two squares? I don't know how much. Yeah, I'm not sure, but still that's, that's scary when you, when you mention that. Yeah, because we're being told this is so great for us. And sadly, chocolate has many other black marks, so to say, you know, it's contaminated with lead and other contaminants that include other heavy metals and has other problems too. Yeah. So that, if we eliminate that's... the sugar somehow it's healthy for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the so... darker, the darker the chocolate, the more oxalate in it. Cause the chocolate, the, where the oxalate's hanging out is in the cocoa fraction that makes it brown. The part you take out with milk chocolate is the fat so the cocoa butter the fat has no oxalate in it really and that's true in nature the peanut oil has no fat but the peanut has has no themselves and the peanut butter and the nut butters are loaded with oxalate so that's that's one way where you sort of isolate the components of something and you can use like if you go out to eat you go to a vietnamese or many of the asian restaurants use peanut oil when they're cooking that's fine there's no oxalate in the oil you know, from an oxalate standpoint. Now there's other reasons to worry about seed oils and their contaminants, but not from the oxalate standpoint. So how many milligrams per day is considered to be high oxalate? I know in your book, you talk about different levels, like I think high and like super high, moderately high, but what, what do you try to do? Like, or what do you recommend to, to other people just as far as like what, you mentioned before, like the milligrams not to exceed, I think you said 70 milligrams. Well, yeah, in a meal, really, ideally, you don't want to go over 70 in a meal. But chances are, if you're doing a spinach smoothie, you're getting close to 1000. Or a spinach salad would be like 450, maybe 500. A decent portion of Swiss chard can have nearly 1000 as well. So, you know, they define a high oxalate diet as 250 milligrams a day or more. And they define a super, super evilly high oxalate diet as about 600 a day. But you can actually exceed a whole day's ex extraordinarily high diet in just one spinach smoothie, which could have 50% more than that even. So the, the new trend of the spinach smoothie is just really toxic. And other, other trends like keto trend where we're using almond flour all the time, that can really add up. And unfortunately, in a smoothie, people can pack in other high oxalate ingredients like the chia seed and the turmeric and the cocoa powder and so on. And right now, there's a really big trend I'm seeing on Instagram of people making desserts with sweet potatoes, chia seeds and chocolate all rolled into one or almond butter and sweet potatoes and chocolate or chocolate and sweet potatoes and some other high oxalate food, plus a little turmeric for good luck. It's and they're giving this stuff to children. Children don't wow. have kidneys to handle it. They don't. Their little bodies really shouldn't be poisoned. Yeah. Yeah, that's important to know. So thanks for sharing that. And before we dive into smoothies further, just want to let everyone know that if, in Sally's book, she actually goes over the milligrams, like milligram, uh, as far as determining the number of milligrams of oxalates in certain foods. 
and I, I have the audiobook version. So there's that little handy PDF that comes with the audiobook. So th very thankful about that as well. So yeah, definitely check out her book. And so let's let's talk more about smoothies because I, I'm I'm I admitted to you before we started chatting that I'm a smoothie person. And I've been a smoothie person for quite a while. And so in 2016, when I did a urinary oxalate test, which which I want to talk about that a little bit later too, but that, that came back positive. So I cut out this, at that point, I was adding a lot of spinach to my smoothies. And so I don't know if we could put together a, a low oxalate smoothie, but for those who might not be willing to give up their smoothies, because I'll be honest, I don't know if I'm willing to give up my smoothie at, at this point. So if maybe we could try to uh, try to construct a lower, like one that's not maybe super low, but not crazy, crazy high. So one thing I've been doing, replacing the, the spinach, and this was even before reading your book, is adding the lettuces like green leaf lettuce, red leaf lettuce, romaine lettuce. And those seem to be on the lower side when it comes to oxalates, correct? They're very low in oxalate, very, very low. I mean, you'd have to eat a heck of a lot of lettuce to get too much oxalate. So you're, you can safely concentrate lettuce and not have too much oxalate. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone can tolerate lettuce. If they've got an overactive immune system in their gut, they could be developing food sensitivities. And I think there's enough other unknown chemicals in plants that just because it's low oxalate doesn't mean it'll work for you. And, and I just like to also preface this discussion about the smoothie with the fact that you yourself are really only starting to have this message soak in and its meaning and what its implications are. And I have to change my behavior. It's brand new for you. It's just only been the last few months that you're learning about oxygen. You should all be patient with yourselves. Give yourself a year to rewrite how you eat and to relearn how you eat and make it normal. I mean, if you're trying to like, completely upheave your entire life at one time. You're just adding stress to your life. And the recovery from too much oxygen in your body is going to take 10 years anyway, so you don't have to rush. <laughs> so, so yes, that's a good start. Like, okay, stop buying spinach. That's a brilliant place to begin. Fabulous. Using lettuce instead. Perfect. And that's pretty easy. You go to the same place to get spinach versus lettuce and just lettuce last longer. It keeps better in the fridge. It actually is more versatile and, um, a lot safer. So that's a great place to start. I do have an oxalate, a low oxalate smoothie recipe on my website. I made that, oh my gosh, seven years ago, maybe that relies on, I think it's got yogurt in it, but uh, lettuce, romaine lettuce, pineapple, and lime juice is the major flavor ingredients. And I think with a smoothie, you want to, if you can do dairy products, you want to use kefir and yogurt and milk and half and half and heavy cream and things like that. And even maybe egg yolks, um, egg yolks are really good for the liver, the brain, the bile, it just it's really nice if you can do egg yolks. So that's a possibility, like put a little protein in there would be nice if you tolerate those things. But if not, you can use coconut milk and you can use coconut yogurt. And then low oxalate foods, there's many low oxalate foods out there, especially if you like green stuff, if you like a kind of a bitter green, then arugula watercress, all of those other greens are low. Um, but again, I think a lot of these greens are best, like the cabbage family, the kale stuff, I, better cooked, not raw. So if you want to use cooked greens and put them in your smoothies, people do literally do that. Um, papaya is really interesting because it tends to gel up. It has this like sticky gummy thing going on. I don't know quite how it does this but you can make a nice thick smoothie with papaya. If you like thickness and you're having trouble making it thick, you can use a little trace of a um, tiny amount of, of flax seed that's all ground up or a tiny bit of um, psyllium husk. Those things will give a kind of a binding thickening effect to the smoothie. Um, grapes and grape juice, Melons are all low in oxalate. The whole cucubit family. Cucumbers are delicious, by the way, in, in smoothies and juicing. Um, and so cucumber is a great base to start with as well. What else? Um, celery is high, right? Because I've been adding celery, and then a lot of people are making celery juice these days. Yeah. But I think you, you yeah. Let us high. Celery is high, but you know, if you're using a small amount, like a half a stick or even one whole stalk of celery, you could probably get away with it, especially in early. You don't need to go to zero oxalate in the beginning, especially. In fact, 
you're better off keeping some of these foods around and you can use small amounts of, of some of these high oxalate foods. So celery would be an example of a high oxalate food that you could use in culinary amounts, but you wouldn't want to eat an entire head of celery in one juice or one smoothie, which is what's often recommended. That's toxic. That's a dose problem. I mean, your grandmother's rolling her eyes that you're eating a whole head of celery in one meal. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? That's not food. Uh, so, but yeah, you can use a little celery in there. Uh, and, you know, as you get going on this, eventually you may find you don't want to do that anymore, but you can literally some of these high oxalate foods, you can use bits of it here and there. Uh, you just, it becomes flavor enhancers instead of entrees. How about collard greens? Cause I add collard greens sometimes in my smoothie. Yeah. That's one of the cabbage family vegetables along with kale and, um, mustard greens and they, these are all in the cabbage family and they're all low in oxalate for the most part i think collards are a little higher than more like a kale in terms of oxalate content which is about three times higher than lettuce but lettuce is so little it's still not that much but again i think if you're overdoing raw cabbage family vegetables eventually it is also gut um hard on the gut. They're a little hard to digest. They can, there's some people who think the raw enzymes in cabbage family is hard on the thyroid gland as well. So it's not unusual to hear if you're going to eat cabbage family vegetables and you have a thyroid problem, cook them. But I think you could, you could steam or blanch them and then add them to a smoothie. No problem. If you like the flavor, hopefully you're eating this because culinarily you're finding this a pleasure and not because you think you need to, or because you forgot how to chew. And, and broccoli, so like, how about steaming broccoli and then cooling it down and putting it in a smoothie? Or is that considered higher in oxalates? Bro it's, you broccoli is pretty good if you boil it. Is Boiling is better with broccoli, but you need to boil it a good solid three minutes. It gets kind of mushy, which is perfect for a smoothie. And um, so it turns into like baby food when you boil broccoli. And that, that's a good thing to do. Throw out the water. Don't put the water in a smoothie. And that that's fine. Yep. That's a good idea if you like it. I mean... Again, I, I'm not sure that we, this is a bigger stretch for people. So I take an entire chapter talking about how we're in love with plants and we're trusting them and we think we've got to have them and we're using them as a um, some kind of insurance policy that we're going to be healthy if we get enough vegetables. And sadly, even though we are saying this to ourselves, uh, it doesn't really hold up that we don't, we're over trusting the plants. And if you don't super love them, then don't make yourself eat them. Now, if you love, love, love them, then this is a great opportunity to figure out how to curate which vegetables are really safer to eat and, and dose them in reasonable quantities. But, you know, uh, the boiling is beneficial, not just because of the oxalate, but you're breaking down those cell walls enough that probably improves nutrient and valuability in all vegetables. You can get more of the minerals and nutrients in them into your body because now you've broken down the cell walls and the other barriers that make it hard for you to digest them. But still there are other anti-nutrient effects of the, the polyphenols and these compounds in the plants. They actually interrupt the enzymes that get the protein out of your foods and the fat and the carbohydrates. Those, those basic enzymes are inhibited by polyphenols. So again, you can overdo the plants. So yeah, use them because you love them, not because you must have them. And, and please don't force your kids to eat green vegetables if they're not willing to eat it. I don't think it's worth the fight. And then based on what you just said, if someone wanted to add a protein powder, then would they would something like hydrolyzed beef be a better option compared to like a vegan protein powder, like a pea protein? Or For sure, for sure. I think the the amino acid profile of animal proteins is much more suited to what we need because we're animals too. So we need it in the same profile that's in the flesh of animal foods. And so uh, all the dairy foods are better protein powder types and meat protein powders, meat based protein powders are a better fit. They're also much lower in lead and other contaminants and even glyphosate and some of these other chemicals that are, that are prone to be on these protein powders, chickpeas, for example, concentrate, uh, oxalate, I mean, concentrate glyphosate. So again, with the plant foods, it's particularly important to be going organic and be selective. But I think from a protein powder standpoint, if you can find a nice beef or something like that, but not necessarily the collagen. I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> 
Yeah, because the collagen is just a few of the amino acids, not a full gamut of amino acids that you need to build bones and muscles, which is the best use for protein is to use it to tell your body, hey, let's get some muscle going. Let's make some bones. The collagen is hydroxyproline and glycine and things. And, and hydroxyproline is prone to being converted to oxalate in the liver. So by pushing more than say two and a half teaspoons of gelatin or collagen powder, you're upping the amount of oxalate that forms inside the body as well. So you by over pushing the collagen. So don't be dumping collagen into everything you make. That's not helping anything. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. And then, and then berries. So people want to stay away from the blackberries, I believe the raspberries, but blueberries and cranberries are. are yeah. Cranberries are very low, very low in oxalate versatile and blueberries are low in oxalate and strawberries. We don't really know. They seem to be all over the map in terms of the testing. There's lots of that's, we didn't talk about that, but plants vary you know, one species to another, one field to another, one season to another, one set of mold attacking to another. The plants are making oxalic acid and oxalate crystals in response to their growing conditions and their genetic propensities. And we grow different genetic forms of strawberries in different parts of the country in different times of the year. And if there's a lot of mold pressure on a strawberry because they're, they're a prostate plant that lays on the ground in this muddy spring and there's mold everywhere. And they, they use oxalic acid plants often have it, um, this, the crystals and the acid in their leaves because they can convert oxalate, oxalic acid into uh, hydrogen peroxide, which helps them beat off the mold. So I think the more humid it is, we see this in tomatoes when they, they're grown in high calcium soils and high humid summer, they make so much oxalate, they get crystals of oxalate in their shoulders and that causes tissue damage in a tomato and the tomato is not commercially viable. It looks bad and spoils quickly. So it's not even good for the plant to, uh, to have to make too much oxalate. Hmm. And then one more question regarding smoothies, as, as smoothie ingredients. You mentioned chia seeds, hemp seeds as being high, but flaxseed that is okay. Just like if someone wants to grind their own flax seeds and add like a tablespoon to a smoothie. Yeah, that's flax is very low in oxalate. It, it's quite low in oxalate. And uh, it is one of the lowest oxalate seeds along with pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are low in oxalate and you can buy sprouted pumpkin seed butter. It's more expensive than some of the other seeds, but you can do things. You probably make your own nut milk with pumpkin seeds too. So they're low in oxalate. If they're not giving you gut damage, again, they're a seed. So some people, if they've really got inflamed guts, even a pumpkin seed that's low in oxalate or a flax seed can be irritating. Certainly psyllium can be irritating. So they're low in oxalate, which generally is good for most of us, but not even, not everything works for every person. So I just want to keep reminding people, you have to customize what you eat according to your health and your tolerance. Yeah. Always listen to your body. So that's always definitely good advice. Body. So testing. So getting back to testing earlier, I mentioned how I did a urinary test for oxalates that was positive. But then in your book, I read where or I listened with the audio book that where you were mentioning that the tests aren't perfect. So if someone does a urinary or, or, or let's say organic acid test that looks at oxalates and if it's negative, that doesn't necessarily rule out oxalates. That's for sure. I, I had an, a couple of organic acid tests that showed I was had no oxalate problem. And um, that's the opposite of the truth. I have had a big oxalate problem that explains a lot of problems I've had. So the thing about oxalate is you're measuring in the urine as the kidneys are excreting it. And the body's not just some thing. It's a living, intelligent being, and it's making decisions in the background. And it has different circadian patterns for releasing oxalate. It tends to clear oxalate out of the system when it's doing its overnight housekeeping. So your first morning pee in the morning might be high in oxalate but then your next P might not be. And that, that next P is the one you use when you do that test. That's the lowest oxalate level for the whole day. So just from a day pattern, you're not necessarily going to see a high oxalate problem based on how we do the testing. That's also true in blood testing. We never test after a high oxalate meal. We test when you're fasted in the morning after the body's cleared it out. So urine and, and blood tests are notoriously terrible at documenting an oxalate problem. Now, if you have high oxalate in either one, that is a truth worth listening to. That's telling you there's too much oxalate. That's, that's not a false positive, 
But if you have a test that says you have no oxalate problem, it doesn't mean you don't have an oxalate problem. Like the test cannot tell you you don't have a problem. It can eliminate the possibility. If that that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. So okay. yeah, if someone has like really high oxalates, then they they really do have high oxalates. But if someone looks, if it looks good or if it's on the lower side, it's probably not completely accurate. So we could essentially assume that most people, if not everyone, <laughs> has high oxalates regardless of what it yeah. shows on the test. And that's why I have this um, symptom and exposure inventory on my website and use it with my own clients because really what's better is the art of thinking about a person's vulnerability. Do you have leaky gut? Do you have inflammatory tendencies, arthritis tendencies, or allergy tendencies? Do you eat a high oxalate diet? Did you ever eat a high oxalate diet? Uh, do you use a lot of vitamin C? Th those are high exposures. It's ultimately over your human capacity. So you've been eating out of bounds for, for some amount of time. It might be two years. It might be five. It might be 30. That's a risk factor. That's for real. You're probably overloaded with oxalate. And then you can see the symptom patterns and say, well, you got a lot of problems that often show up with oxalate problems. So that, that's actually more helpful. And then doing the diet itself can be a form of a test, a way of kind of seeing what's going on with the body. You can, if you get low enough, sometimes the body will tell you, wow, things are changing around here. I can start doing something and some odd things might happen. Um, or you can be in mostly low and then suddenly eat a big slab of, I don't know, keto chocolate birthday cake full of almonds and sweet potatoes and chocolate and get really sick from that. And suddenly you're able to see it. You're able to see that connection. You mentioned briefly vitamin C, and that's another problem that you mentioned in your book is taking higher dose vitamin C. I think really anything that's a thousand milligrams or higher is what I think you said. So you, you don't recommend like regular vitamin C supplementation. No, not at all. If you're used to using a lot, you want to come down by halves and work your way out of a high vitamin C. Vitamin C, excess vitamin C degenerates into oxalate in the body. And it is a major, major source of oxalate poisoning is supplementation with vitamin C because the supplements all are 500 or 1,000 or more. And that's way beyond what you need. I mean, we've stretched the RDA all the way up to 90 milligrams but you really don't need a huge amount of vitamin C unless you're living on pure sugar. The higher the carbs in your diet, the more you need vitamin C to deal with the oxidation and the inflammatory stress. But vitamin C, you're trying to feed your immune cells and take care of them and give them what they need. And there's only so many of them. There's a lot of them, but they only need so much. And if you exceed what they need, the rest of it is just it can become poisonous to you. So it really is a chemo toxic drug when you take these super, you know, beyond our physiology kind of doses, really, the body can barely handle 400 milligrams a day, really 250 would be an upper bounds. Even when you're sick or experiencing allergies, 250 is usually enough or a day. Even that though, I would spread it out into like four doses. So you can use foods like lemon juice and maybe acerola cherry or something to get smaller doses. It's hard to find small doses, but vitamin C supplementation is too common. And it's really sad that we think we're helping our health yet again with C, collagen and spinach, and it's actually causing a poisoning in the background. So when it comes to reducing oxalates, obviously you want to reduce the food, get rid of other sources such as molds. But you did mention, I think a few times here that you don't want to like completely try to not that you will be successful eliminating all the oxalates, but you don't even want to make a dramatic decrease in the oxalates right away. It sounds like you want to want it to be a gradual process. Yeah, because we don't know whose system is just so over ready to get rid of the oxalate. Because remember, we said it collects in the thyroid gland and 85% of us, if you're up to 50, you've got oxalate in your thyroid gland. Your body doesn't want it there. You've got oxalate in your bone marrow and your tendons and your bones and your kidneys. And your body may be queuing up to like try to get rid of it and has been probably trying in the background here and there. But now that you've stopped eating it, that gives the body total permission. It couldn't do it before. The reason it's building up is because we're eating it over and over again. If you're eating a high oxalate meal every four or five days, you're maintaining oxalate deposits in the body. When you stop doing those high oxalate meals consistently for 
three to five days, that's enough space to give the body permission. It's like, oh, okay, you're not eating this junk anymore. So let's clean house. And you start cleaning house too fast. If you go too fast, some people systems just start sort of what I call sort of vomiting oxalates out of tissues. That's dangerous. It's again, it's a dose mix of poison that can be pretty toxic and dangerous. And some people get heart arrhythmias and hypertension and all kinds of problems that they end up in the emergency room after they stop eating spinach smoothies because their system is now really um, in a kind of toxic cleanup crisis. So you, you can avoid the crises somewhat pretty much if you well, get my book, that would help <laughs> because it'll help guide you through the sort of complexities of this. Like, yes, it's poisonous, but you still need a little bit of it to keep from having this auto intoxication that's coming from the deaccumulation process that's going to take a long time, but can start and, and start and stop in sort of vigorous ways that can be rough. How about like calcium magnesium citrate? Is that something that people could take to benefit or is that as long as they're gradually reducing the oxalates and foods that, that they don't need to supplement with those? Supplementation with citrates is really helpful in many ways. The oxalates have been creating a mineral deficiency because it's a mineral chelator. Oxalic acid is grabbing calcium and other minerals. It's disturbing the cells and they're losing minerals. So you, you're running on a mineral deficiency and you're running on a potential of a metabolic acidosis. And as you're clear, you get into acidosis as well. And so the, the citrates are so helpful. The calcium is a chalk. If you need the calcium to remove, it's the main binder that removes oxalate from the body. So calcium supports the body's wish to get rid of it. It hangs out in the gut for you because you don't absorb a lot of it. You absorb maybe 20% of the calcium in a supplement or in your food. And it stays there as it's passing through the colon. So you want to keep calcium in the colon. So taking calcium, the citrate form is lovely. The citrate molecule comes off as easily absorbed. You need that citrate molecule to uh, protect your body, especially the kidneys. The citrate molecule itself breaks down oxalate crystals. It helps soften them and protects the kidneys and the, the urinary tract. So we love the citrate form. If you tolerate a calcium citrate as a, a number one sort of therapeutic adjunct to the diet. Magnesium, likewise. Often you need to be taking some thiamine to help with the magnesium use and thiamine deficiency creates more of this endogenous production of oxalates with the hydroxyproline and so on. So you want to make sure you're not thiamine deficient, but potassium is another one. All of these citrates help to lower the acidity and that improves the chances that you won't get kidney stones. And so as you're releasing oxalate, it's possible that you could create kidney stones when you stop eating oxalate because you have this deaccumulation traffic, which can be worse than your diet was on your kidneys. And that's always confused researchers. They say, well, oxalate, the low oxalate diet doesn't work because you got kidney stones after you went on the low oxalate diet. But that's because the low oxalate diet will trigger this, this deaccumulation process, which overwhelms the kidneys yet again. So the citrates will protect you from kidney stones and support the release process. And it also helps to lower the acidosis, which can make you feel ill. And Acidity is terrible for your long-term health. It, it can make you feel bad in the short term in kind of weird ways you don't really realize it's acidity. But in the long run, this mineral leaching and this acidity creates osteoporosis and it creates cancer, especially metastases of cancer when you have acidic metabolism. So and it, the clearing turns on more inflammation. These crystals hanging around in your thyroid gland is turning on inflammation and inflammation itself creates acidity and acidic stress and so on. So the, the minerals are super helpful. You need to re, you need to, them as binders. You need them to get rid of oxalate. You need them to improve your nutritional status. You need them to manage the sort of acidic and other disruptions of your homeostasis in the body. So I highly encourage you playing around with them. They're safe to use. Um, but the main thing is try to get the diet right and then use these adjuncts to support it so that the deaccumulation process goes well and it's safe. So for those listening who have oxalates to, or oxalic acid deposited in the bones and glands, such as the thyroid, which describes most people listening to this, uh, if not everyone, can that be reversed? Like by reducing over time, just, it, it sounds like in your, I think you said, yeah, well, 
you said it took, it takes time, like years. It's, it's something that it sounds like can be done, but it's not something that'll happen like six months or a year. It could take, I think you said nine years in your case. Yeah. So it can take a very long time because the, the, the volume that your bones can hold is phenomenal relative to the poor little kidneys job to get rid of it and your vascular system and your skin and everybody's trying to help get rid of it, including your gut. So yes, it, there's no question that the body will take on this housekeeping and try to get rid of the junk. It doesn't want it there. And it's the body doing it. You don't need a special program or a magic herb, or you don't have to tell the body to do its work. It wants to do the work. You just have to stop getting in the way. You've been blocking the body's intent to get rid of this junk. It's been holding on to it because you've been eating it so much. It hasn't had room. If it was allowing this stuff to keep flowing around and moving around while you're eating more of it, you would have dropped dead of a heart attack or a stroke. So it, the body's done this to protect you from a heart attack, from kidney stones, from vascular damage and from a stroke. But now that it's clearing it out, it's going to have to take its time because if it all went quickly, you would drop dead. You would have a heart attack. So literally it's good that it takes 10 years to clean out, but it's not good because it takes immune activity. It takes inflammation to dig these crystals out of your tissues. And that is stressful on the tissues. And even that can generate cancer cells and, and keep this kind of autoimmunity stuff kind of going. So the slower you can go, the less you're going to have this overactive immune system that leads to autoimmunity and continued problems with allergies or that malaise that comes with being sensitive to everything. Um, so yes, it's reversible, but really prevention is what's really we got to do. We, we don't want to wait to get sick before we recognize that eating too much oxalate more than we can handle is eventually going to be bad news. So if we would pay attention to the toxic effects of oxalate, we could prevent having to have all this inflammatory tissue damage and so on and find out what human beings are supposed to be like, how much less pain we're supposed to be in. <laughs> all this aging we're doing, this dementia, arthritis, osteoporosis, loss of mental acuity, loss of energy. A lot of that is the kind of things that oxalate creates. And chances are you don't have to be a feeble old person who needs a nursing home if you learn early enough in life to not eat so much oxalate. And this is sounds so radical, but it's, it's just there in the science, really. I mean, they're not to the level of funding where everybody is agreeing about it but it's pretty obvious when you start looking at it and living it. And living it is pretty convincing. I don't want anyone to live my life. I would rather they not go through all the stuff I've been through. Well, thank you so much, Sally. I mean, you shared a lot of great information. And if, if this excited you, like it, I mean, I, I never thought I'd be so excited about talking about oxalates, but Definitely check out Sally's book, Toxic Superfoods, which you could find again on Amazon as well as other places books, books are sold. And can you remind people where else they could learn more about you, Sally? Yeah, come visit me at my website, which is sallyknorton.com. Sallyknorton.com. There's a lot of free information there and some downloads and you can sign up for a group class and see some presentation slides. I'm on Instagram here and there and LinkedIn. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook. I do have a Facebook page, but uh, my website, if you need to reach out to me is sallykeynorton.com. That's the best place to find me. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a uh, great chatting with you about toxic superfoods. Thanks for your interest, Dr. Eric. It's really been great to get to know you a little bit. See you on the other side of the smoothie. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank you.